plunge very much into what I would regard as the unknown. And the unknown is, does the technology work? <laughs> um, we literally got a phone call yesterday afternoon at three o'clock to advise us that the Assistant Minister for Defence, uh, Matt Thistlewaite, the MP, who is the member for Kingsford Smith locally, uh, has COVID. And the technology people then got extremely busy. John Howells, who is our technology expert, uh, they claim that we will be able to have this presentation. And uh, there are a number of comments like, trust me, I'm here from, to help you, I'm from the government, etc., etc., that many of you would know and understand. So uh, we are about to, I hope, uh, have the presentation from the Assistant Minister for Defence. Uh, there is some information, and I'd like to make uh, a linkage. It is also the blamey oration. And if you are going to deliberately go ahead, you will find that for many years, very distinguished people have been asked to give what is called the blamey oration. And Sir Field Marshal, Sir Thomas Blamey was one of the distinguished commanders of Australia, one of the very few Australians to hold the rank of Field Marshal, and I'm delighted to say that one of his uh, relatives, uh, grandson as I understand, uh, is available, and at the end of the Blamey oration, uh, the Blamey medallion will be presented on behalf of the Blamey Foundation, and I'm deliberately giving that overview because quite frankly, we're about to find out whether the technology works or it doesn't. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Can I acknowledge the traditional owners of the land and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. I also uh, acknowledge Her Excellency, the Honourable Margaret Beasley, the Governor of New South Wales and patron of the Royal United Services Institute for Defence and Security Studies in New South Wales. I'd also like to acknowledge any serving Australian Defence Force personnel and veterans that are with you in the audience there today and thank them for your service to our nation. Sincere apologies, everyone, that I can't be there with you. Unfortunately, I uh, tested positive for COVID yesterday, so. I'm, of course, following the New South Wales uh, health guidelines and didn't want to risk uh, putting anyone else there at risk. So uh, I'll do my best to deliver this uh, speech online. Uh, and I'm happy to take some questions at the end if, uh, if anyone has any. So it's a great honour for me to be asked uh, to deliver this speech. Um, and before I begin my remarks, I want to also acknowledge the vital role that the Institute plays in Australia's discourse around defence and national security by bringing together serving and retired members of the Australian Defence Force, civilian defence and security professionals, and leading thinkers in the field to engage in dialogue and debate around key security issues of our time. And especially to be part of the fourth international defence and security dialogue which is focusing on managing strategic tensions in the Indo-Pacific region. It's the right time for all of us to be deeply engaged in avoiding conflict and promoting stability, peace and security within our region. And I'm very grateful for the honour of presenting this oration, which is in the memory of Field Marshal Sir Thomas Blaney, who was commander in chief of both the Australian military forces and the Allied land forces, Southwest Pacific area. I'm fully conscious of the debt that we owe to those who fought and died in the Second World War, and with profound respect for their heirs in today's Australian Defence Force, who would, of course, willingly do the same if asked to defend our nation. I make the point that all tools of Australian statecraft are being driven towards avoiding the warfare caused, uh, oh, sorry, that caused Field Marshal Blamey and his compatriots to take up arms in the service of Australia. 
We also acknowledge openly and frankly that Australia is facing the most challenging and complex set of strategic circumstances that we've seen since the Second World War. And in this context, I want to speak today about the Albanese government's defence and national security priorities and policies. At the time of the release of the Defence Strategic Review that was commissioned by the government, The Economist observed that the Berlin Wall still stood the last time Australia took a hard, independent look at the state of our defence. That report was, as I'm sure you all know, commissioned by the former Defence Minister Kim Beasley and conducted by Paul Dibb. The reference to the Berlin Wall is an apt one because it's clear that in the post-Cold War era, which notionally began with the fall of the Berlin Wall, a period characterised by democratic expansion and unprecedented integration of global trade is now at risk. As the Canadian Deputy Prime Minister Christia Freeland recently observed, it ended when Vladimir Putin ordered his tanks across the Ukrainian border. In its place is a world that is witness to the return of war in Europe, growing climate change risks, rapid military modernisation and disruptive technological change. In our region, the Indo-Pacific, we see increased strategic competition between nations. The world's strategic centre of gravity has shifted in the Indo-Pacific and the intensity of competition will be the defining feature of our region and our time. We see the second largest conventional military build-up that we've seen anywhere in the world since the Second World War. And we place the rules-based order that's been the key to the region's development and prosperity as the key to defending. Australia's interests lie in a region that operates by rules, standards and norms where every country can pursue their own aspirations. Australia is not alone in seeing the Indo-Pacific as a much tougher strategic environment. We're working with our allies and close partners to better protect our sovereignty and of all nations within the region and helping to shape a safe, prosperous and stable and balanced Indo-Pacific is a priority of the new government. National defence will be the strategic approach for defence planning that we will take, a genuine whole of government coordination. It will require investing in Australian defence, including through the acceleration of important capabilities and activities and the reprioritisation of those which are no longer fit for purpose. To ensure that no state will ever conclude that the benefits of conflict outweigh the risks. Above all, and in short, our approach to the Indo-Pacific is anchored in a resolve to safeguard our national interest while supporting regional security and stability founded on sovereignty and global rules-based and international rules-based order. I also want to acknowledge that strategic competition is not the only security issue in the region that we face. Transnational crime, people smuggling, illegal, unregulated and unreported fishing, freedom of navigation and a fragile commitment to international law are all real and current issues that are confronting Australia and our partners in the region. None of us can conclusively solve all of these problems on our own and no nation in the region is immune. So real solutions and real cooperation is required. The government is committed to working with the United States and our Indo-Pacific partners to constructively shape our region together in support of our many collective interests. And the alliance with the United States remains the cornerstone of Australia's foreign and security policy, and it's as strong as ever. AUKUS is perhaps the strongest signal of the deepening of our alliance, but we're also 
stepping up our cooperation under the bilateral force posture initiative that was first established by the Gillard government. We're also looking to actively find new ways to deepen our partnerships that make us stronger together and help to build security in the region. Our quad partnership with India, Japan and the United States is a key pillar of our foreign policy. Our priorities align with the quad agenda for taking action on climate change and building a stronger and more resilient Indo-Pacific region through better economic security, better cyber security, better energy security, and better environmental and health security. The Quad complements our strong network of multilateral partnerships, including ASEAN. We're also building and strengthening our bilateral relations with like-minded partners in the support of stability in our region. And Japan is a critical partner there. In January this of 2022, Australia and Japan signed the Reciprocal Access Agreement. That was Japan's first effective status of forces agreement with another country other than the United States. And this treaty is not alone in, uh, is not the only um, streamline um, and ability to deploy in the territory. It signals our intention to increasingly work with partners in the region. In October, Prime Minister Albanese and Prime Minister Kashida signed the updated joint declaration on security cooperation, which will act as a compass for our security relationship and allow us to refine the scope and objectives of our regional cooperation. It also includes a commitment to consult on contingencies that may offer and affect our sovereignty and regional security interests uh, and to consider measures in response. These are two agreements that now give Japan and Australia the bilateral architecture to ensure our defence and security cooperation is commensurate with our strategic alignment. We also have a genuine willingness to stabilise Australia's relations with China, our largest trading partner, with long-standing economic and people-to-people -people links. Prime Minister held the first leader-to-leader -leader meeting with Australia and China in six years. And there's been meetings between defence and foreign ministers, and you would have seen more recently last week with trade ministers. We've got a steady and consistent approach to our bilateral relations with Beijing as we seek to uphold the rules-based order. And we're committed to resolving long-standing differences through dialogues. And as I said, you saw that dialogue once again recommencing around trade last week. The government uh, was elected with a vision for an Australia that's more engaged and more responsive to our Pacific neighbours as well. From the Prime Minister's historic address to the Papua New Guinean Parliament, to the Foreign Minister's frequent respectful engagement with our Pacific neighbours, to the Defence Minister's purposeful engagement as and part of the South Pacific Defence Minister's meeting. The government's demonstrated our willingness to listen and respond to the real concerns of the nations of the Pacific. We've long been seen, as you know, as the choice, uh, the partner of choice for Pacific nations. And they're now seeing Australia choosing to be the best possible partner by listening and leaning in to their understanding of the risks that they face. And that includes in relation to climate change. The Defence Strategic Re Review explicitly recognised climate change as a national security issue. And I want to be clear that the Albanese government is taking action on climate change because we recognise the threat that it bears to our region and to Australia. Climate change is an urgent issue for Australia and for Australians, but it's also an existential threat for many nations in the Pacific. And by ensuring our defence assistance is responsive to Pacific nations' own assessments of the risks that they face, we're building solidarity and capacity and, most importantly, 
we're contributing to the most effective regional response to the most global of issues. The government's also revitalising our historic deep engagement with Southeast Asia. What happens in Southeast Asia matters for our security and prosperity. We're investing in our defence partnerships across the region and tightening our military ties. We're proud to have become the first dialogue partner of ASEAN almost 50 years ago and one of its first comprehensive strategic partners. And we're committed to the ASEAN Defence Minister's Meeting Plus Framework, which is a pre-eminent regional defence forum. When considering the government's approach to reforms to defence, I think it's worth reflecting a little on the assessments that have brought us to where we are today. The former Australian government released the Defence Strategic Update in 2020. Its assessment was that Australia faced an environment of increasing strategic competition and the introduction of more capable military systems and the increasingly aggressive use of grey zone tactics. It concluded that Australia could no longer rely on a 10 year warning time of major conflict in our region. It was a big observation to make, but it was the correct observation to make. And it's accepted by both government and opposition, consistent with Australia's long tradition of bipartisan consensus on national security. There's also bipartisan support, and I'm happy to acknowledge that there remains bipartisan support for the former government's initiation of the AUKUS Trilateral Partnership with the United States and the United Kingdom. But there, there was a question from the then opposition, which I was a member of, as to now what? What do we do to ensure our defence and security settings best respond to the environment around us? And what must we do as a nation in terms of posturing our defence force? And the response of the government was to initiate the Defence Strategic Review led by Stephen Smith and Angus Houston. The public version of that review was released on the 24th of April this year, and the government's response was released with it. The fundamentals of the assessment of our strategic environment identified in the DSR were confirmed by that review. And as the review states, no longer is our alliance partner, the United States, the unipolar leader of the Indo-Pacific. Intense competition between nations is defining our region and our time. Major power competition in the region has the potential to threaten our interests, including a potential for conflict. And the review sets out the full array of challenges that we face, including the use of coercive tactics, the acceleration an expansion of military capabilities without necessary transparency, the rapid translation of emerging and disruptive technologies into military capability, nuclear weapons proliferation and the increased risk of miscalculation and misjudgment. The government's response to this was to set out an ambitious agenda, but one that is necessary. And we've gone back to fundamentals um, as directed by defence, uh, and they include defending Australia in our immediate region, deterrence through denial of an adversary's attempt to project power against Australia through our northern approaches, protecting Australia's economic connection to our region and the world, contributing with our defence partners to the collective security of the Indo-Pacific, and contributing with our partners to the maintenance of the global rules-based order. To maximise the deterrence, denial and response options for the government, the ADF must harness effects across maritime, land, air, cyber and space. Our Navy must have enhanced lethality, including through its surface fleet and conventionally armed nuclear-powered submarines underpinned by a continuous 
naval shipbuilding program. Our army must be optimised for littoral operations in our northern spaces and continue to provide long-range strike capability. Our Air Force must provide the air support for joint operations in our north by conducting surveillance, air defence, strike and air transport. And we must also continue to develop our cyber and space capabilities. We've accepted the uh, review's recommendations um, and particular one for a national defence strategy that will be released in 2024. To reorient defence, to have the capabilities necessary in light of our strategic circumstances, the government's agreed in principle uh, and with further work to the review recommendations and we've identified six priority areas that we'd like to work on. And they are acquisition of nuclear powered submarines through AUKUS to improve our deterrence capabilities. Developing the ADF's ability to precisely strike targets at longer range, manufacture munitions in Australia. Improving the ADF's ability to operate from Australia's northern bases. Initiatives to improve the growth and retention of our highly skilled and highly capable Australian Defence Force. Lifting our capacity to rapidly translate disruptive new technologies into ADF capability, including through the AUKUS partnership and working closely with Australian defence industry and deepening our diplomatic and defence relationships with key partners in the Indo-Pacific. Work to implement those review recommendations and those key priority areas has already begun and the funding was secured in the budget that was released last week. Defence spending as a proportion of GDP will grow by about 0.2% by about 0 .2 over the forward estimates. And over the next four years, the government will invest more than $19 billion to implement the immediate priorities identified in response to the Defence Strategic Review. And these include $9 million for the nuclear powered submarine program through AUKUS. $4.1 billion for long-range long range strike capabilities, $3.8 billion for northern bases infrastructure, and almost $400 million to support our Australian Defence Force personnel through new recruitment and retention initiatives, and $900 million on defence innovation, including establishment, establishing advanced strategic capabilities accelerator through AUKUS Pillar 2. There's also additional funding for key defence partnerships in the Indo-Pacific, which builds on our extensive engagement in the region. So the full scope of the defence reforms, which incorporate workforce, industry and science and technology, uh, are probably beyond the scope of this oration, but that could indeed be a whole oration in itself. But we are making key investments in those innovative areas as well because this will be a multi-generational effort, including but not cer certainly not confined to the acquisition of conventionally armed nuclear powered submarines. But it is all, I believe, essential. Australia will always seek peace and will always engage to uphold peace. That we have the means to step up in ways I've outlined is due in no small part to the economic dividends of the peace secured by the service of those like Field Marshal Blamey and the institutions established after the Second World War to ensure that conflict did not again escalate in the way it did back then. There's much to discuss today as much as well as to learn and listening to the different perspectives that you'll no doubt discuss will be valuable, particularly in the newly contested world. So I thank you for the work that Rishi does. I thank you for the engagement that you have with the government. Once again, I'm very, very sorry that I couldn't be there. I was really looking forward to meeting many of you and having a fulsome discussion. But my door is always open. If there's ever any other events that you'd like me to attend or be involved in, please feel free to ask. Thank you once again and enjoy the rest of your deliberations an extremely event, important event annually, 
is that the Blavey Foundation, and uh, <coughs> sorry, gone the wrong way. There is a Phil Marshall Sir Thomas Blavey Memorial Fund. It's a, it's administered, for example, the, the previous um, head of it was at Major General retired level. It is meant to be a very major recognition by an oration in honour of Field Marshal Sir Thomas Blamey. And we're delighted and pleased that we have with us today uh, Thomas Ted Blamey, the grandson of Field Marshal Sir Thomas. And we will now go through a notional presentation to the Minister. Um, uh, I will uh, guarantee that I'll pass it on. <laughs> but, uh, but I also say that I would appreciate that uh, you come forward, please, make whatever comments that you would feel appropriate. And so, everyone, could you welcome, please, Mr. Thomas Ted Blamey. And, uh, <laughs> Um, distinguished guests, Your Excellency, Minister in absentia, ladies and gentlemen, and members of the Royal United Services Institute. Thomas Albert Blamey's service to his country spanned four decades and two world wars. But what else can we say about him? I've been invited to briefly respond. That he was and remains Australia's most decorated commander. That he landed at Anzac Cove on the 25th of April 1915 as a major led some skirmishes against the enemy, and by May 1918, at the age of 34, he was Brigadier General Staff under John Monash. And that he, with Monash, planned and executed the famous Allied victories on the Western Front in the Battle of Hamel in May 1918 and the Battle of Amiens. That, after World War I, he chaired the committee that established the Royal Australian Air Force intervening between the two existing services to secure agreement. Then in World War II, he was the only Allied commander to retain command from the beginning to its end six years later, leading over half a million troops at any one time. That he with Sidney Rowell was the architect of the near miraculous Allied retreat from Greece in 1941. In the words of the Australian official historian, the fighting withdrawal of more than 300 miles, generally along a single road with the loss of but one fighting unit, was an outstanding military achievement. And of course that he played a vital hands-on part in preventing the fall of Papua New Guinea and the possible isolation of our nation. That he is Australia's only field marshal. What did other military and national leaders say about him? General John Monash described him as a man of inexhaustible industry with an extraordinary ability for self-effacement. And he said, I was able to lean on him to a degree which was an inexpressible comfort to me. Prime Minister Menzies said, none matched him in power of command, a quality hard to define but impossible to mistake when you meet it. Arthur Caldwell said of him, the next man to blame me is like a curate to a bishop. <laughs> British Field Marshal Lord Wavell, as Commander-in-Chief, said he was probably the best soldier we had in the Middle East. Major General Sir Edmund Herring said, always one of his main concerns was how each of us, his generals, was likely to treat and care for his men. And General Douglas MacArthur, not one to freely hand out praise to Australian commanders, said, I've always felt that his services in the Second World War were not sufficiently recognised. What he did cannot be overestimated, and his contribution to the defeat of Japan marked him as one of the great soldiers of our time. Australia, and indeed the whole free world, said MacArthur, owes him a debt of gratitude. And many more gave high praise for this man, whose name is all but forgotten today, not taught in schools and sparingly commemorated in public institutions, his memorabilia and fine portraits by famous artists buried in the vaults of the Australian War Memorial. Yet 20,000 people filed through the shrine in May 1951 where he lay in state. Ten generals and 4,000 troops escorted the gun carriage which bore him through the streets of Melbourne, lined by 300,000 people standing in respectful, often tearful silence. Field Marshal Sir Thomas Albert Blamey, GBE, KCB, CMG, DSO, ED, was a great Australian. 
Only one son survived the second war, two grandsons, myself and my brother, and three great-grandchildren remain. But our small family area are moved to see the blaming oration continue, not only as an important contribution to the national debate on security and defence issues, because maybe in its small way it can also help redress the balance on blaming and foster renewed appreciation for his service to our nation. I say, let's revere our national heroes. Let's recognise and applaud merit, strength in leadership, courage, loyalty. Let the tall poppies stand, and so encourage new ones to grow. We, his family, applaud our USI and all those who have faith in Blamey and what he stood for. We thank the Minister for his insightful and most interesting address. And now it is my honour to present the Blamey Medallion on behalf of the Field Marshal's Thomas Blame Memorial Fund and its chairman, Major General David McLaughlin retired, uh, in absentia to the Minister via your President, Michael Howe. Well, Ted, on behalf of all of us, thank you for that very erudite and very clear presentation. And I can only imagine the great pride the family must have in being able to recognise and, and see uh, him honoured in this way. And uh, I might say an unexpected benefit is that I now have received my anti-war hall 10 seconds of fame. <laughs> I briefly had the, the, the blaming for that. Uh, we will make sure that that is passed on uh, to the Minister. And as such, uh, we are delighted that we're able to simply combine this very significant international dialogue with, and with the presentation of the Blaming Medallion.